The Super Media Bros Podcast is a founding member of the Odd Pods Media Network. together though that's the thing is like i i'm almost surprised that there's not more movies like sweeney todd to an extent or even repo the genetic opera yeah where it's like some form of horror and music in general really right welcome to episode 274 of the super media bros podcast i'm richie and i'm Devin, and we're gonna get right to it it's a short and sweet stack of uh fuckery this week and it's not even really mm-hmm. fuckery but fuckery in the sense of you need to check the shit out if you have not yet evil dead rise and we're also going to talk about some music so fucking sit back relax and just let us entertain you the evil dead rise is coming in the back half of this episode but we're, we're going to jump into some music shit so i i'm going to let this man take the reins on on what's oh, up shit. first but i want to lead off with the fact that for Poppy's newest single, mm. dude, I was really surprised whenever I told you that it was a cover and you were like, wait, it is. Yeah. Um, so I know that she is known to do quite a few covers, uh, but they always sneak up on me because Kitty is one of those bands that I actually have a couple of CDs of, uh, but because they're CDs, like I just sort of pop it into the player. Right. Like you don't necessarily go back back to it right right and that's not even necessarily a a problem with the music itself i fucking love the music you and i have talked about kitty before uh especially at the my place bar whenever we would just vibe and listen to it oh that's right yeah because i remember oracle like because i showed you oracle yeah you show me oracle and you actually introduced me to deftones with diamond eyes uh same night so that was insane but Either way, I would I would grab the CDs and I would just put them in the player and I wouldn't worry about the track list. I would just let the music sweep me away. So I didn't look at any of the names. And also because, you know, I grew up in a household and also time period where that sort of music was not a thing. So it's not like it got radio waves and I was like, oh, that's a really popular song. So I spit was completely under the radar right and like you had to have like head like because at, at the time when spit came out you know when kitty was brand new mm-hmm. uh there was shit like much music usa you know di- there was also much music in canada but like when i had first heard of kitty was on the much music usa tv st- uh, station mm-hmm because MTV sure the fuck wasn't playing a lot of stuff. Like, they were kind of on their way out of playing videos, and <laughs> this is before much music became Fuse. So that's what most people know that station as is Fuse. But yeah, there was quite literally a metal music segment. Like, because the way that much music used to work was they would have Uranium, which was the heavy metal program. Mm-hmm. And then they would have, like, other programming for other genres. But every time Uranium came on, without question was like bodies by drowning pool and fucking like whatever the latest corn single was. Um, I think untouchables was one of the albums that was out around that time, which is one of my favorite albums. I'm raising my hand right now. Um, you, you said the name corn. Don't ever speak of corn's name in front of me without doing a scat. Do oh. the scat for the people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking love that shit yeah yeah that was pretty cool <laughs> thank you drive through so <laughs> yeah so that was the shit that was around on tv youtube is now where most of our music videos are consumed mm. and it's fitting that who was first a youtube star and poppy is now like 
musically inclined and kind of just combining her her performance art with her own music and dude the last cover i heard from her was uh probably tattoo oh wow i i thought you were gonna say all the things she said that's tattoo oh okay yeah all the things she said cover was fucking brilliant it was but i dare say and, and this is coming from somebody who adores uh the band kitty this was a pretty fucking heavy goddamn cover and i'm not too ashamed to admit it but whenever poppy posted the teaser <laughs> you fucking texted me when you did this shit dude there's like a little clip where it was on loop of poppy like spitting it was just instinct i didn't even mean to it this, was just pure reflex this man opened his fucking mouth <laughs> dude i tried to catch the shit I know. <laughs> dude i stopped and i looked around to make sure that nobody was in the house watching me. do you have one of those like self cringe moments just a little dude, bit just a little bit come on a dude little bit. i'm not gonna lie i used to say that shit as a meme I caught myself being dead ass though. You got a, you're probably like you just sat there like fuck. I have a problem, <laughs> bro. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, the way my mouth just gaped that moment. <laughs> just, god, that word's so funny, <laughs> dude. And I was being completely serious. I and now on the air, I will say it out loud. Poppy can spit all over me. She can beat me. She can fucking stomp on me. I don't care. <laughs> Wear metal cleated high heels and stomp on my sack. <laughs> Shit. Dog, I don't care. Uh, I know. Hurt me. I'm in love with that woman. So how's the music? Oh, the music's fantastic. But anyway, so about the the fucking oh my god, dude. The stagger music video had me triple bricked up, dude. I, <laughs> So how about them sponsors? <laughs> what sponsors? <laughs> Dude, that drip tip was nefarious too. Oh my God. Ugh. Just a puddle of my kids on the floor. <laughs> I got nothing to <laughs> Jesus Christ. I fucking got nothing. But yeah, no, uh, the music actually is great. And the, the thing is, is she's really good at those piercing screams. But also, like, clear. Like, you can make out the verbiage. Yeah, I'll be honest. The first time I ever heard her music, it's not that I didn't expect it to be good. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect what was coming out of her. Yeah. Because that's not at all the genre I was, like, geared at. No, because uh, I remember whenever she first came on the scene, it was just the I'm Poppy music video. Or not even music video, just a just a plain old video. And I was like, okay, whatever. Moving on. And uh it wasn't until Triple H did an interview where he talked about listening to her music while he's working out and shit. And I was like, is that the same girl? That can't be the same girl. Right. Like Look, there's no way Triple H listened to her. Yeah. So I, I just looked it up bored one day. It was during the pandemic. And uh you remember this. I used to go on like God, like two hour walks every fucking day. Right. And because uh, you would just send me fucking music. You were listening to like screen caps like, hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. Hey, look yeah. at this. Bored out of my fucking mind. And uh, I was on a walk one day and I was like, I guess I'll check this out. Whatever. Looked it up and just kind of scrolled through her discography and saw I disagree. And I was like, that looks fucking metal as fuck. Okay. You would be right. Clicked on it. And you know me, huge Mr. Bungle fan. And there were shades of that in there. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Then there's a track with a fucking Marilyn Manson feature. And I was like, oh, my God. And from there on, I, I've been hooked. So for this, I mean, I'm glad that she's staying with her heavy fucking roots and Almost doubling down on it in a sense. Well, I mean, she went back to Sumerian Records for this release. Mm -hmm. That's saying something right there. Like, right. Because you know certain labels are just like built for certain, mm -hmm. you know, genres or whatever. I'm wondering if this is going to be a, not necessarily one and done, because she has even said that she is genre fluid, where she'll go back and forth and everything. 
which I like. It keeps me excited as a fan, but the EP that she dropped for Spit was only two tracks, one of which we had already gotten a few months ago. I mean, it's it's technically a single. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. like, it's... It's two songs that you know they're going to be appearing on whatever full album is coming out. And that's what I'm wondering is, is there an album? She's working on one. She has said that, but I I was just trying to figure out if it was attached to this or if, you know, you remember uh, last year or maybe even the year before. I don't even know. But Pi, it was 314. Yeah. And I thought I I even made the the false um, prediction on the show where I was like, Mark my words. March 14th, she's dropping an album. <laughs> she didn't. It, I was looking too deep into it. It was just named after her cat. That's, yeah, that's, that's the most poppy thing to fucking happen to. I know. Which I knew that that was a cat's name, but I thought that it was all a big, like, a big thing. You thought it was part of, a, like, a bigger, bigger, sch- a bigger scheme. Yeah, it, it wasn't. But by no means has she let me down. Like, the, the, this shit was fire. I loved it. Yeah, me too. And yeah, the, I'm looking forward to whatever else she's got yeah, coming down. Dude, and the fact that Kitty even shouted her out on Instagram, I was like, fucking A, dude. Kitty are cool as, as shit, dude. Like, there are bands out there that are absolutely, like, when I say this, I don't mean it in a, um, I don't mean it in a flattering way when I say it. There are some bands out there that are just, they have a rock star attitude. Mm-hmm. Kitty do not have yeah. rock star attitudes. Uh, for fuck's sake, Mercedes and Morgan, like the two sisters, have been in, doing this for fucking literal decades now. They are two of the most seemingly down to earth people. Mm-hmm. Just looking at their Instagram pages, like I follow both of them, and they are just fucking like everyday people, and they just happen to be in a kick ass metal band and have other cool fucking music projects. Right. So it's like, of course, they're going to fucking shout Poppy out because, first of all, it's another fucking metal like representative there. But then Spit is Kitty it was Kitty's first big fucking hit other than Brackish. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. And I don't want to butcher the pronunciation. I'm not from the area, but another band that seems really fucking down to earth would be Kayla Mikla or Kayla Mikla. I'm not sure, but. They seem really fucking cool. Yeah, they really do. Uh, you know, that's a segue for you. Yeah, I was going to say that's a good segue because we got to attend uh, Villa Vallo's Neon Noir tour in Houston last week. And the aforementioned band was the opening act and the only opening act mm-hmm. from Iceland. And they sang in their native language. Uh, and I was just like, fucking A, that's really cool. Like, I felt like I was watching if the Northman, the movie, the Northman, mm-hmm. it felt like it, if I was listening to the Northman, but with like 80s drum pads and synthesizers. So I've never been to an quote real concert where there was actual like lights and whatnot. I've been to a high quality dive bar concert, okay, uh, which was really good, but I'm just saying. So I was looking around. So I don't know if you noticed this, but I'm sure you did where they had TVs on the two corners of the balcony, right? Yeah, they usually do that at most venues for anybody that's not up front to the stage or nearby because they can like kind of see what's going on. Well, I, I looked over while the opener was playing and maybe it was the the grading of the the colors and all of that stuff. Maybe it was the actual like stream quality. I don't know, but I couldn't help but like let my eyes wander to the TV screen rather than what was in front of me only because I kept getting the sense of like, it's like 12 in the morning and you walk into your house, your parents are asleep on the couch or recliner and they left on PBS oh. and they're playing like, a new up and coming musician at a random ass venue and it's being recorded and maybe 10 people are there. You've seen those. Yes. And you know, the color grading and film quality I'm talking about. That's what it was giving me vibes of. And I mean that in a good way, because like I just felt so like 
this is so unique. Like the kind of like Anderson East, where whenever I was wa- I walked in and he was playing uh, all on my mind, and I was like, I don't even know who this is, but I better fucking figure this out. I need to find this out. I if I walked in and this was playing, and she was like moving with the music the way that it was, the lights were the way they were, like all of it. I I would have ventured out to find this. So before we get into the actual venue, Mm -hmm. I need to fucking preface this by saying like, I get the hustle. I really get the hustle of being a street busker of being like a street musician. I fucking get it. I'm a musician myself, (laughs) but, but, but there is fucking etiquette. First of all, this man just kind of rolls up to the second floor where we're in line and he sets off in a corner. I don't know why it took it. This, <laughs> I don't know why it took security a half hour of this man playing the same fucking song to come up and shut him down. <laughs> this man was playing covers of like him, like the band acoustically. And, uh, I'm going to fucking help butchering them. I should say I feel terrible, but my God, it was just like, <laughs> this is not the warm up we needed, bro. I knew we were in for it whenever he hooked up his amps and everything. And all you heard was, <laughs> and then he fucking starts strumming. <laughs> oh, fuck. You ever, you know, when you play rock band or guitar hero and you, mm. and the, before the song pops up, you hear the fucking amplifier, um, being plugged in yeah. and you can fucking hear the open strings going, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. Like I get, I just kind of had that fuck, you know, moment. Dude, I, I knew from the beginning we were, we were in for it. Anybody in the South is going to know what I mean when I say this, bless this poor guy's heart. <laughs> He, Bless his little fucking heart. He he was doing something. He was trying. <laughs> he was really trying. I'm trying to not be a total dick, but it was the most fucking god awful annoying shit. Because I'm trying to hold a conversation and I can't concentrate because I am too fucking like cringe filled to fucking talk about shit or fuck all. I will say this though. He made a couple dollars. He- I can't even lie. He made a couple of dollars, but I was getting at the fact that, like, my man's got that big dick energy because whenever the fucking security told him to leave. Oh, my God. Okay, so we. Okay, good. We will end this on, like, praising this fucking guy. He fucking was like, okay, yeah, I'll leave. (sighs) And when I tell you, he took his sweet fucking time packing. Bruh. He fucking took each individual, like, guitar pick and slowly placed it where it goes he took his chords and slowly rolled them found where they go in the guitar case went to close the lid said no reopened it rearranged a couple of things kind of finagled with his his stool and he he honestly was probably packing just as long as he was performing. Yeah, for sure. And best the best way I could compare this to anything is you guys remember the uh, the sloth scene in Zootopia? Yes, that's that's it, dude. Dude, he he knew what he was doing. Oh too, fuck yeah, because he, he set up relatively quickly. He can move. He just wasn't, and it was it was pretty fucking funny because, like, again, I respect the hustle, but I was just I was so annoyed. I think because I'm like, dude, come, fuck, oh god damn it, come on, we all know why we're here. Yeah, like I don't I don't want to hear the dude singing music we're about to go fucking watch because I'm gonna be like really like just oh my god. But I, w- but I will give him credit here though. He wasn't covering songs that played at the show right the dude was covering a lot of deep shadows shit yeah like he did enjoy it and sorrow uh he did vertigo eyes which was on neon noir but it was not performed at the show this motherfucker performed the extended cut of enjoy and sorrow that's that's the song this man fucking played for a half hour dude we're not kidding he yeah he probably played that full song like 
three times. Yeah, it's like he he would stop and retune and then pick it back up and then stop and retune and then pick it back up. Same spot every time. I swear the chorus was like longer than than fucking ever. But any fucking way, the man slowly packed and he fucking left. And that's when they started moving the line indoors. <laughs> I feel like they may have been trolling us. Now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, I feel like these bastards were probably trolling us. And you know what? Valo probably would do some shit like that. Like, like I, I can't even talk like that, man. He's like, I'll, I'll pay you, so I'll, I'll, uh, pay you in, uh, like $100 if you go out there and uh, just get the crowd all riled up. <laughs> and he's just like real calm about it. And and the whole time, you know how he does, where he just has his two fingers over his lip. Right. Just kind of like just in thought and just yeah. deep thought. Oh, I think it'd be really funny if you just go out there and, you know, play the most enjoyable songs, but in the worst way. So many times in a row. <laughs> how many times? Yes. <laughs> Dude, I can fucking see it, though. Right. But we get in there. So first of all, uh, Kaylin Mikla or Kaylin Mikla were fucking phenomenal. They uh, were. Loved every second of that set. And then those fuckers, those three chicks came and sat literally two like rows in front of us in our section to watch Valo's set because the, the balcony seating was half sold out. Mm -hmm. I say half sold out. We all know some people bought balcony seats to go to the floor. They don't give a fuck oh, yeah. at the House of Blues. So Valo's set was really good. Uh, obviously, like I knew it was going to fucking be. I've seen this man with him, and this was like his first solo jaunt, but I've seen this man fucking five times in a row in concert. And I enjoyed the fact that it was like flip-flop. One solo, one him cover. One yeah. solo, one him cover, which is really weird to refer to it as a cover. It's his music. I know. That's what I was thinking whenever you said it. I was like, I mean, you're not wrong, but you are. I don't know. His backing band is, is like, God, yeah. that is a fucking well-oiled machine. Dude, it was so good. Yeah, I keep, I keep sitting here like having like flashbacks to it because I was so like just in the zone watching. But every once in a while, I just needed to look over to my left just to see how <laughs> much you were enjoying it. And it was the most pure goddamn shit I've ever seen in my life. No, for real, dude. It was fantastic. I fucking loved it. Yeah, dude, cuz like like I said, I've never really done this shit before, so like I was like holy fuck. Uh the man played for what? Like an hour and a half. Yeah. And it was like fucking he basically played the entirety of Neon Noir live, which sounded great live. Yeah, almost. Uh there was only missing like he was only missing three tracks. Yeah, I was about to say two or three. Yeah. Yep. And then um, the 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 cuts that he did play from him's music catalog was was great. Yeah, I was a little surprised that there was. I shouldn't be, but I was. Uh, no Screamworks. Yeah, I mean Screamworks didn't even get a lot of love on their farewell tour. Well, Screamworks was not the roaring selling album that they were anticipating either and neither was tears on tape sadly well that i kind of understand not quality wise but like the band was winding down and i think they all knew it so that i i i get but like screamworks was his first album back from rehab so like to me i'm like you guys as fans didn't like leap on it like what right I'm not understanding that. Yeah. But he mostly played from Razorblade Romance and mm -hmm. Love Metal, which, of course, those two albums and, and Darklight, really. I was about to say. But, like, the two Finnish released albums, those are probably the two most popular of the four mm -hmm. from Finland. Now, whenever they came to the States and released their four American albums, Darklight always just takes the victory on that one because he had... They had written several singles, like potentially. I mean, we had two big ones, but you can tell, like, when Wings of a Butterfly hits, <laughs> like, everybody loses their collective shit. Yep. So, that was a big one for me growing up. Yeah. And I was just 
a fan of him uh, playing uh, When Love and Death Embrace because that's yeah. probably one of my all time favorites of theirs. That's like, to me, him in a nutshell could be summarized in that song. And that's why it's so fucking good. And what a great closer. Yeah, it's a good closer before the encore. But if I remember right, um, that was the actual last song on the farewell tour. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. it was the very last one that they they played. Fitting. It really is. But I mean, he even played the song with agents when he was doing his like jaunt with, mm -hmm. you know, that's them. right. Yeah, that was the one English spoken song they would cover. Dog, whenever the kiss of dawn came up. Oh, you lost your shit. It was dude, great. It was great. dude. Well, that's like my favorite fucking hymn album. So anything that it could have been fucking <laughs> sort of suicide. And I still right. would have been like, yeah, I, I was I, I knew he wouldn't play it. But uh, bleed well is probably my jam from there. Like, Ooh, so God. I was hoping for more but like i know he had to be very particular with mm -hmm. which ones he was gonna bring because there's so many i know man like that's why i can't even like trip about nothing from screamworks or uh shadows and highlights even which we kind of got our fair share with the dude outside of the venue but you know what i wonder if that was part of the troll where he was just <laughs> that's like what I'm saying. fingers on his you know hand uh his his face again just sitting there he's like well, I'm not really playing these. I mean, you could go out and play these, and um, I'll pay you hundred dollars. Like, for some reason, it's just a hundred dollars. Really, I'll pay you hundred dollars. I can fucking see it. I'm not convinced that I. I think we figured it out. I do too. So, if anybody in Houston that was there, that knows what we're talking about, because we 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 did have some people that listened to our Neon Noir review episode from Houston. Dude, that terrifies me so do, much. Do you, know, do you know this man? Because maybe he is a double agent and he works with Ville. <laughs> it would be fucking hilarious if he did. Probably win the agents. Probably so. <laughs> I mean, the man looked like he would be like running with them. Like he had, yeah. he had like the long black hair and he had like the mustache and everything. And I was just like, now I really am sitting here like looking back on this going, this motherfucker. Was he, he was sent there. I oh, yeah. He was fucking sent there. Dude, I'm glad you brought up the long black hair and the, and the, and the beard and everything. Because, dog, until I got a hoodie or something from that venue, I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. Bruh. Okay, so, like, before we, like, leave this subject, like, mm -hmm. holy fuck, that was kind of funny. So, you don't even look out of place there, first of all. But this the idea that in your head you felt out of place because like we're standing in line and it's nothing but like a sea of black boots, <laughs> jeans, shirts, jackets, fishnet, makeup, piercings, everything. I'm standing there in my fucking ripped up jean shorts, Converse and a flannel. I'm looking like I'm about to go to a fucking Pearl Jam concert, but I wanted to be comfortable. God damn it. And my man over here is rocking like a crisp ass black shirt, a crispy motherfucking hat, black Chuck Taylors and a pair of blue jeans. And I'm like, this is damn near like it's like the school uniform of concerts. Like you can't go yeah. wrong. You cannot go fucking wrong with that shit. I know. But at the same point, I looked around and I was like, dude, I've always been considered like the goth kid of my friend group. And I'm looking around being like. Dude, I'm not goth at all. I'm just alternative. <laughs> I'm just edgy. That's you're all. Y'all alternative. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm basic. <laughs> you were good, dude. It just cracked Dog, me up. This, that you were this is why Hot Topic did not hire me in high school. They took one look at me and they were like, "Well, your personality fits, but you don't. We can't have you at the front desk." That's fucking funny. Like we're here to talk about how how was y'all's time at the concert? Man, we had a great fucking time. Devin, what about you? Man, I felt out of place. <laughs> I did, uh, dude. The concert was ten out of ten. Loved it. Okay. God damn it! I was looking around before I put that hoodie on, and I was like, dude, why do I feel like they're looking at me, <laughs> and they're just like, you don't belong here. Like I I genuinely felt like I looked 
like that one. Because y'all got to understand this. I wear my hats backwards more often than not. And I had a chain. And so I felt like people were looking at me and thought, see that guy over there? Yeah, he's not one of us. <laughs> that right there is a fucking frat guy that was trying to talk to one of us because he thought, hey, bro, <laughs> I'm going to get with a goth girl. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And he's probably been talking to her for about a month. And she just broke up with her boyfriend and said, well, I have an extra ticket to this concert if you want to come. He's just here for the girl. He doesn't listen to Ville Vallo. Dog, I got a fucking heartogram tattoo. Fuck you. I got a fucking sleeve. Like, <laughs> fuck you. Yeah, <laughs> like, bro, we, we in this bitch, okay? Yeah, we, we, we out you. <laughs> like, for real. But I was cracking up, too. Like, you were going on that tirade. The only thing I kept thinking was, they're all saying that shit. Where all three of us are sitting there because it's me, you, and my girlfriend. We're all fucking sitting there like, mom and dad are taking son out for his first concert. That's, yeah. what, it, that's what it fucking felt like. <laughs> yeah, because I was just looking around like, holy shit, look at all this shit. Dad, can I, where's the gift shop? Dad, can I get a t-shirt? <laughs> yeah, like, I was like, oh, like, Dad, can I have $25 to get a t-shirt? Fuck off, kid. <laughs> we brought you here. That's enough. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> no, but like, you but know what I'm talking try to afford that $7 can of water. <laughs> <laughs> right? Shout out to Liquid Death for fucking hydrating my fucking fat ass for this show. Dude, that shit was crispy as fuck. I fucking love Liquid Death water. Fucking sponsor us. But anyway, yeah, for sure, dude. The Valo concert was fucking 10 out of 10. Uh, 666 out of 10, if you will. <laughs> Would fucking do it again. Will do it again. I hope he does another album. I hope there's so many more and so many more tours and all this shit. We're going to take a short commercial break. Literally, a commercial break. We're going to offer you some fine products to buy from our sponsors. You're going to hear about some other shows you can listen to and maybe some fine products from other people in other places. And if you're not going to listen to it, it'd be a lot cooler if you did. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> you're listening to the Super Media Bros podcast on the Odd Pods Media Network. You better sit your pretty little ass right there and wait for our return. <laughs> this summer, ensure that your body is ready for the wild with a game-changing full-body grooming and hygiene product. Don't be the guy at the beach with Austin Powers chest hair. And if you grew some winter man tits, the least you can do is make sure that they're hairless. It's time to get ready for hot guy summer with Manscaped, the leader in body grooming. Hi, Richie here from Super Media Bros. Did you know that you can get 20% off and free shipping by using our code super at manscaped.com? Yeah, 20% off and free shipping. It's pretty rad. Manscaped is dedicated to helping you increase your confidence and leveling up your full body grooming game with the Performance Package 4.0. The kit comes with the Essential Lawnmower 4.0. It's a waterproof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your grooming routine. So whether you're trimming your chest or the treasure chest in your pants, this is the best trimmer on the market. Their trimmer features a ceramic blade designed to cut hair on loose skin and reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. Inside the performance package, you're also going to find the Manscaped Crop Reserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer because we know how painful chafing can be when you're wearing your bathing suit all day. And no one likes nose hairs, so the package also comes with the Weed Whacker 2.0. You're also getting two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag, which is a $39 value add, and the patented Manscaped Boxers. If you're wearing sandals, you need to get the Manscaped Shears 2.0 Nail Kit. You really don't want to look like Fred Flintstone. Trust me. So having the right tools for grooming is essential. And you can do yourself a favor and always use the right tools for the job by going to manscaped.com and getting 20% off your entire order plus free shipping with our code SUPER. Again, that's 20% off plus free shipping with our code SUPER at manscaped.com. Trim your chesticles with the besticles from Manscaped. Hey, I'm Hansel Aaron from the BFYTW podcast here with my buddy Stevie. Hey, what's up? And Augie. Hey. And we're here to, first of all, uh, categorically deny the rumors going around that all we've been doing lately is copying other podcasts. Uh, this is categorically untrue and we deny it completely. 
Having said that, please enjoy the rest of the Super Media Brothers podcast. And when you're done with that, uh, feel free to check out our new project, Ultra Telecommunication Siblings, a show where best friends give informatively comedic takes on music, gaming, pro wrestling, movies, and more. Pretty sure that's never been done before. So we have been summoned back from commercial break by the uh, Necronomicon X Mortis, which they actually referred to as Natron Dimanto in this one, which I was so happy about. Which one summoned us? Was it the first, second, or third volume of, of, of this? I wonder. See, now we're going to get into Evil Dead Rise. We're not going to get too, too into it, but I would love to talk about the fucking highlights of this movie. Mm the possible future of the franchise and the fact that this motherfucker as of this recording just hit a hundred million dollars at the box office and they were going to dump this on fucking HBO max. Yeah. And it wasn't until test screenings, whenever all of the executives were like listening to the crowd reactions and everything. And they were like, yeah, no, this is going in theaters. Yeah. Evil dead belongs in the fucking theater. Okay. And it's so weird. Cause like, as a consumer, it would have been so bittersweet because on one hand, it's like, dude, I can hurry up and watch this shit. Holy fuck. And I because I have like a blanket of like, I'm sure you've seen it where it's the VHS tape of the original cover. Really fucking sick. I would have been like, dude, I'm going to break out the fucking blanket. I'm going to like sit back and watch, have a bunch of my friends come over because that, that's actually been one of the things I, I love spreading the evil dead. To all of my friends. Uh, shout out to Aliana because she's like, what the fuck is that? She watched it and she's like, about three quarters of the way in, she was like, I think we're going to pass out. Like, she she was getting so disgusted. And that's saying something. And then whenever the movie ends, she's like, that was actually really good. I feel lightheaded, but this is really good. I'm like, oh, bitch, just wait. <laughs> yeah. And then... So she came with us to see Rise, and she was like, that was amazing. It's disgusting, just like the other ones. I was like, yeah. And that's the thing about Evil Dead Rise. Here's the fucking greatest part, okay? Mm -hmm. I will go on record and say that this is not as gory as the 2013 Evil Dead, nor actually, it's kind of, it's a little more so than what Raimi kind of brought to the table, but in a different fashion. Yeah. This one to me is comparable to Dead by Dawn. I was about to say the second one, yeah, because I feel like the first one was just gross. Evil Dead was just like the OG, like the Evil Dead was gross out horror. Yeah. Uh the second one had the slapstick element kind of tossed in there. This one had the dark humor in there too. Mhm. Um which the setting helped that it was at a different place and the fact that this movie caters to both people that have never heard of the franchise and people who are diehards. Yeah. Because I also went, uh, it was a whole army of us. Okay. There was probably like 12 of us and, uh, two of which were Jalil and his at the time fiance now married. Congratulations, bro. Um, but no, they went with us and them two had never seen any of them in fact it wasn't until like four days before the movie i was like dude like this is my favorite series of horror movies blah blah blah. and he was like wait there's a series there's more i i just thought that it was evil dead rise like i thought that was a name and i was like no dude no we unfortunately because work scheduling conflicts and everything we never got around to watching them together but he was able to watch it and be like no i understood everything like, he didn't get all of the Easter eggs, but it, it never took him out. Right, and that's what I was going to say. This movie is full of them, and I'm yeah. talking literally full of them. Like, there's a scene where the mom sends um, the kids to get pizza. The pizza company is Henrietta's Pizza. The fucking tree service is Fonda's tree service, and that is a direct reference to Army of Darkness where Bridget Fonda played Linda because Linda had, like, three different actresses playing her. Mm. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of fucking funny, too. And just small things like that. Taking this out of the woods, which I also enjoyed the uh, fact that the movie is kind of a wraparound segment and how it starts on a lakefront in a quote-unquote cabin-ish setting. So you kind of get set up with, oh, it's another cabin in the woods kind of bit. But moving it from there to the city was a fucking great idea. 
Yeah. In a Los Angeles high rise apartment because it's like the Evil Dead Rise title is a play on both the high rise building itself and the fact that rising from the dead. Fantastic. The opening of this movie really sets the stage. Mm hmm. I love the drone being used in place of the evil force to kind of fake you out. Yeah. By the way, spoilers. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's the scalping dude, scene, dude, that shit was fucking sick. That shit rips homie. Okay. Dog shit. I fucking loved rips. It. I loved the fact that I knew what I was getting into and I knew what to expect, but looking at the reaction of anybody in the theater that did not know what the fuck was going on, because when that scene happened, I will reenact this. Okay. When that scene happened and you hear the, not even like a second after that, this is what I heard, like probably from the front row way away from me. Oh God. (laughs) And flailing and cringing. They have no idea that that is tame for this series. Yes. I was like, it's brutal, but that's not the worst thing to happen. Like, Two people in this entire franchise, and I'm talking about the film, mm-hmm. have sawed limbs off of themselves willingly yeah. of their own volition. Yeah. They weren't possessed or anything. They were trying not to be possessed. But yes. Like- so there's a couple of scenes in the movie that I think for me makes it heavier because there are children involved. Which I love that they went there. Yeah, I did too. Uh, that that's what kind of made this one a little heavier because it's a mother and her fucking children, as opposed to just some friends go to a cabin. Mm-hmm. It's not that we didn't care, but you kind of give more of a fuck here, right? The way the Necronomicon is done in this one is it's got teeth on the outside, and it can only be opened. We find out with, and this is not even. There's no context given. It just happens, and you just kind of assume by dr- uh, blood droplets being placed on the book. The way the Necronomicon came about in this one was really interesting. It was like uh, a group of priests had found this book and they buried it under this apartment complex, which is like over an old bank vault. The recordings, instead of being like on a tape player, were on vinyl records. Loved that. Same. Uh, The oldest kid, or the middle kid, I think, yeah. It, he yeah, he's like working with like Serato, like the DJ mixing system uh program in his bedroom and uh it's a family of musicians obviously. Like the sisters are both involved with music somehow and tattooing and in the, the arts and shit. The Bruce Campbell cameo in the recordings where he's just like yelling destroy it. It's called the Book of the Dead for a reason and even Lee uh Cronin the director has stated that He specifically asked for Bruce Campbell to record that cameo because in his universe, in his mind, that is a displaced Ash Williams somewhere in time. Which is so fucking sick. Yeah. And he also delved into the third volume of Nacheron de Manto because in Army of Darkness, there are three of them. So in his universe, we are to assume that one Necronomicon exists in the Ash Williams universe. One Necronomicon exists in Mia's universe from the 2013 Evil Dead, and then the third volume exists in this universe. Mm -hmm. The element of time travel, the element of those three books, and the element of this not being the only time that this has happened, apparently, in any history, including the three aforementioned timelines. They want to do a movie every two to three years and make it, for lack of a better term, an anthology series. That loosely ties in with one another. Which is so funny because we both were talking about that concept years ago. Like, I'm fucking thrilled. Yeah, because we were talking about it when Ash vs. Evil Dead got canceled. Because we were like, okay, well, what do we do if we don't have any more films like that tie into this universe? And it's like, you could give this an anthology feel because anybody could come across that book. Mm -hmm. And it's all different walks of life. But how do you get it out of the cabin? And lo and behold, this man done fucking did it. Yeah, it was fucking great. What were your favorite parts of this? Because there's a ton of like characters that are introduced like on the 14th floor of this place. And, you know, it's it's like nobody downstairs underneath them for all the shit that was going on. (laughs) This is what blew my mind. Nobody knew what the fuck. 
well, you know what? I mean, they're probably like, yeah, uh, we've got a floor above us. It's expected. You know, like. Oh, that bitch fucking again. They probably thought that yeah. shit. Too. They probably, oh, she's fucking again. Yeah, she's trying to make baby number four. God damn it. Yeah. Dude, all the things that I loved. Okay, so it's going to sound weird, but I don't mean it in a negative of the movie. My favorite part of this movie was getting hyped for the next one. And that's not to downplay this one. It's just like they have put themselves in such a unique position. As far as this movie goes, uh, the swallowing glass scene was a good one. I love the fact that the kids were not pieces of shit. Like they weren't like, shut up, mom. Or this is why dad left or nothing like that. They were good kids. They, that is absolutely true. The entire family dynamic because the sisters... That was a very good, realistic portrayal of somebody that got wrapped up in their own career and like kind of mindlessly ignoring her sister's need Mm -hmm. to have someone there when she was going through it. And then the kids are just trying to be there for their mom. And it was real. Yeah. And I loved that. And that's why I was attached to them, honestly. I also loved the fact that whenever the mother did get possessed and everything, she was, correct me if I'm wrong, this is like the first instance I can think of off the top of my head where they could fight the deadite, like, growing within them. Nope. Think about, think about when Ash got possessed in Evil Dead yeah. 2. Yeah. See, to be fair, though, I always thought of that as... Like a sheer willpower thing, or... No, I thought of this one being willpower. Uh, as a mom, whereas I thought they just, I always interpreted it Ash as them being like, I like this one. Let's have fun with this one. Right. Like he's a dipshit, but he's a, you know, he's a clusterfuck, but that's why we fuck with him. Yeah. I always felt like at a moment's notice, the evil dead itself could have wiped the floor with Ash. They just chose not to. Right, like they three stooged him to death, which th- yeah. there was a three stooges m- uh, mural on old boy's bedroom wall. There too, was, yes. Because I had like shimp on it, which is like a whole call in reference to the fake shimp, like the thing that they used in these movies. But but either way, uh, whether whether her fighting it off was a new thing or not, uh, that was really good because like, you know, it, it's cliche to say, but people always say, oh, when you're a parent, you would blah, 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 you know, you, you would take a bullet for them, blah, 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 and you just have so much whatever the fuck, you know, and they kind of exuded that in this, and I don't know, like, a little bit of a wholesomeness to it in a really morbid way. Yeah, um, there's a couple things that I will point out, because, like, when you brought up the whole fighting in the, uh, the Deadite within them, remember in the other Evil Dead films how the Deadites to fuck with you would give the host body its original form back Mm -hmm. for a split second or two. Mm -hmm. Never once happened. No. And I feel like the sequence where they finally get Ellie out of the apartment and they barricade the front door shut and Cassie, the youngest sibling, is looking through the peephole. That dumb bitch. She's six years old, dude. Like, it's... It's bad enough. Like she saw that happen. Mm -hmm. And now it's just like, okay, do I trust my mom? Like the whole scene where she's like, oh yeah, your dad and I are getting back together. He's right over here. And all this, like shit was fucked. Yeah, it was, it really was. But here's the, here's the thing though. I feel like that scene may have had a little more impact. Had she like presented as completely fine, untouched mother, Mm -hmm. like that would have, been a mind fuck for that kid even more so because when she finally unlocks the door and all that took was that because her whole arm just shoots through and grabs that little girl by the throat and she's just hanging and you just the rate i will i will admit this ellie is probably one of the best performing deadites in the entire franchise because like that bitch was visceral as fuck she and she looked menacing as fuck she looked menacing as fuck before she turned bro that's that's what fucked me up i'm like oh this she's on one <laughs> yeah like i was like she's so nice she's and, on demon time 24 7 yeah like dude. she looked she was such a nice person but i was also like 
How do I feel like she bites? <laughs> <laughs> she fucking does. She looks like she's bit a man in a bar fight. She probably has, man. Which, thank you for jogging that for this because I, I want to point out a couple more things before we jet out of here about this movie. I really enjoyed the Easter egg with Linda's pencil stab wound in the ankle. I loved that. With the tattoo needle being shoved into the oldest uh, daughter's uh, cheek Mm -hmm. and whenever it's spider webbed out. And I think that's what kind of fucked me is whenever I like I knew the kids were going to get it in some way. But when I knew that they were going to go full tilt with possessing two of them, which that was insane seeing how that happened and like how the pages of the Necronomicon were foretelling a lot of this stuff. Oh boy, getting stabbed through the goddamn bicep and then stabbed mm-hmm. in the chest and having blood puked on him very heavily. Uh, old girl getting set on fire. Like you said earlier, the glass swallowing the fucking, the cheese grater to the calf Ooh. muscle. I'm glad they didn't kill the cat. Yes. I was really worried. That's what was going to happen. I thought for sure. Here is my question to you as well as the listeners. Okay. I, I know that this would be a absurd and controversial film, but hear me the fuck out. What if in the next one, because think about it, think about it. When Ellie's in a possessed state, went to kill her sister and like clawed at her stomach. There's a baby in there. Yeah. We didn't even mention that. Um, how her sister is, visiting because she's pregnant and that is also kind of another dynamic where it's just like okay well it comes off as beth is only around when she needs something Mm -hmm. and the fact that she was aloof to the dad and slash husband leaving and all this other stuff she takes a positive pregnancy test like almost at the dead beginning of the film at a concert because she's a guitar technician for a rock band now like you said that would be insane as fuck. Like it's like it's been done to death. Like the possessed baby storyline, like fucking Nightmare on Elm Street Part Five. Come on. So I would love if that motherfucker just like xenomorphed its way out of that bitch's stomach. Dude, imagine though, like how fucked up they would be willing to go. Because I feel like Nightmare on Elm Street did it, but I feel like. If you had the whole film be based on that, the mind games that you would play there. What if they do two more films Mm -hmm. and then another one where those characters, the surviving characters from this one come back full circle older. Mm. Then you got the baby is born. (laughs) The baby may be Cassie's age. Now Cassie might be 12 or 13. Now Beth is a little older. Shit comes back around. I mean, I'm not saying they, they are going to do this, but where do you go? Do you take this to a different city? Do you take this to, like, do you, do you tie it back to the cabin somehow at some point? Not necessarily full tilt going in the whole movie. Do you say, like, oh, um, oh, we found, like, that's how you kind of, like, make reference to Ash in that universe where, like, Possibly. maybe police finally show up to the fucking cabin and find the aftermath. Maybe people show up and find the aftermath of the 2013 timeline. I, All three of the books come together, maybe? One thing that I would love, and you and I talked about this off the air, but going to do it on air, uh, pun intended here, is you came up with the name Evil Dead Air. And yeah. that was the one where I pitched, like, dude, wouldn't it be cool if like some college kid found the Necronomicon just anywhere and was like a Twitch streamer and was like, let, let me read this book on Halloween night on stream. Just it looks like a spooky book, whatever, you know. Yep. And because it was read and because those words were spoken in all these different rooms throughout the, the stream mm-hmm. and all the speakers are being allowed. Yeah. Like, I feel like you could start a fucking anthology based on that alone. Yeah. Like, One ha- guy's fuck up. One, like literally one dude's fuck. And that kind of goes now that I'm thinking about it. Do you remember the PlayStation two video game of uh, evil dead? I didn't have a PlayStation two. Okay. So there was one that had come out and it was called uh, evil dead hell of the king. And that was for the PlayStation, like the original PlayStation. And it was kind of resident evil style or whatever. Oh, wow. Okay. So they, they did a sequel 
and this one was on the PS2. And that story was that this man finds the Necronomicon on a talk show, like a television talk show, and reads it. <laughs> and the fucking transmitter, like the tower transmitter, does this to the town of Dearborn, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily everywhere. While that would be the different concept is like a Twitch streamer, this could go literally globally. Yeah, and you could have like World War Z, but it's with the Deadites. And number one, you can make as many fucking movies as you want with this premise. Like, kind of like with what the MCU did, where it's like, yeah, Endgame is over, but we still talk about the effects of the the blip. Yep. Kind of have that going on with yeah. this. Uh, and also... You could do like, for one, look at the locations. It could be anywhere. Um, it could lead up to crossovers. Let's say Ash shows up in a huge movie with all of them crossing over. You can have like, I, I, I don't know. It, to me, that just sounds like such a sick premise. I, I don't know. I don't know why you wouldn't go with that eventually. And even Bruce himself has stated this out loud he would only do it if sam raimi was the guy directing it Mm. for fuck's sake just do it yeah one more fucking time and save it for that though like if you want to close the franchise for good save it for that yeah and here's the you want to know what makes that so special though it would be a modern retelling in a more serious manner of army of darkness like you would be coming full circle with the with the series like it's almost as if yeah the prophecy has been fulfilled just in modern time shit you could even i mean this part would be a stretch but you could even make the connection by saying oh yeah the kid that read it on the twitch stream yeah that's actually ash's son that he's never met it was a hookup right or even with other movies, um, I mean, same timeline, obviously, but dude, you could fucking make an Evil Dead film in this universe or this franchise, like, or whatever, with fucking Kelly and Pablo. Yeah. Bring, bring the fucking ghost beaters back, man. Fuck. Hey, Warner Brothers, if you do want to hire me to write that script, I would love to. And we'll totally be the Twitch streamers that fuck up the entire world. Yeah, I would like that. I can grow a rat tail and, like, look really trashy. I yeah. can... He's already grown a rat tail. Don't let him fool you. Shut up. I'm going to make them think I'm method acting. Okay. Yeah, I can grow out a rat tail and a, and a really, really gross goatee that like has crumbs in it at all times. Like I can, I can look like a fucking neck beard, dude. You could look like the dude from Royal Crackers. <laughs> <laughs> you already know what I'm talking about. Dude, let's be honest. That dude really is me, though. I'm telling you. Yeah, so the movie ends very well. I think the way that it kind of gives the open door because they never, because, you know, like the evil is usually quote unquote vanquished in some form or fashion, but then it always comes back for one more scare, Mm -hmm. as they say. Turns out the beginning of the movie was actually the end of the movie. So it was so sick. Yeah, so old girl levitating out of the lake is actually like the very last event to happen in this fucking movie. And that sick abomination of all the bodies coming together. And then the whole, like you'll be dead before dawn. And then they start chanting dead by dawn. Dude, that shit was fucking hype. I was legitimately like, I was creeped the fuck out, dude. I was like, I was fanboying. I, I was, was marking out, but I was creeped out at the same time. Cause I'm like, bro, they coming for that elevator and it will not shut and it will not work. The gallons and gallons of blood used in that finale was fantastic. The fucking uh, tree grinder, the chainsaw, the boomstick, the come get some reference, the whole fucking shebang, if you will, was awesome. Evil Dead Rise, in my opinion, is probably the third best in the entire franchise. Oh my God, it's so tough. Here's where I fucking sit my top three and people that are probably listening to this and that are fans of the entirety are going to be like, really? But I really stick by this evil dead Two, then the 2013 evil dead. And then oh, this wow. one. Oh, I hold that 2013 film in high fucking regard. I do too. Um, dude, it's then army of darkness. <laughs> I, it used to be army of darkness. 
and then the original and the second one were like interchangeable right as i've gotten older though it's like i can't i fucking can't like it's going to sound like a cop out and it totally is i i consider the original trilogy to be one film <laughs> I do too, and I want to go ahead and go on record and fucking say this because it's been pissing me off. Evil Dead 2 Dead by Dawn is not a fucking remake. It is not a fucking remake. It is not a fucking remake. They literally could not get the rights to the original film to use for the fucking flashback sequence slash the recap sequence to show how Ash is still at the fucking cabin. Mm -hmm. So they had to just reshoot with what they had, and they made it real quick and really stupid, and the scene where he gets fucking pushed through the woods like by the forest where he's all spinning around and all that shit. That's what happens at the end of the first one. So if he did a super cut where he's walking out of the fucking cabin after all his friends are dead, the evil force picks up and comes through the back door and flies through the living room and flies out the front door. And he quote dies in the first one. No, the motherfucker gets pushed through the goddamn woods, falls in that puddle and sleeps his ass off all day. And then that's where the second one picks up. Yeah. Then obviously the time portal fucking shit happens and he goes back in time and then army of darkness happens. That's the whole fucking thing. Evil Dead and Army of Darkness takes place over the course of two nights. <laughs> and then however long he was in fucking the goddamn medieval times. 1300 AD was a long time ago, motherfucker. And he's being dragged to his death. God damn it. Go see Evil Dead Rise in the theater if you haven't. Because it is going to be dropped on digital pretty fucking soon. Like sooner rather than later. Uh, I would easily give this one probably like an 8.5 out of 10. If I'm being like honest with my rating here it's like an 8 to an 8.5 it's definitely not perfect by any fucking stretch of the imagination for me the most perfect film in this entire thing is evil dead 2 yeah i think an 8.5 is fair um which is i just want to clarify this because i used to be such a stickler for it i've mellowed out in my age but i don't, I don't know uh as a kid i used to think 8.5 so what was wrong with it nothing sometimes things are you wouldn't necessarily change anything about it. It's just like, yeah, no, this was perfect for what it is. I, I'm just being fair. Yeah, same. Like, it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. it like, A plus, okay, like it is. It's just, I don't know. that there, There's nothing that took away that 1.5. It's just, this is where this it is. is. This, this is the way. Yeah. Motherfuckers on fucking social media, I swear to God. If it's not a perfect 10, they think it's ass. Bro, some of the movies we watch for this fucking podcast, they could be some of the most garbage ass things, but I still like them. Yeah. Like, I don't give a fuck about your rating. Even though we're giving a rating, it's like, I don't give a fuck about your rating. Like, our rating is our personal shit. It's what we feel it is. We're not telling you, like, oh, it's fucking good if it's like 8.5. No, dude, go watch it. Even if I was like, it's a 2.4, go fucking watch it. Be yeah. your own fucking judge. I get so sick and tired of motherfuckers ditching an opportunity to, to watch a film because they're like, oh, I heard it sucked. Like, I, I talked to somebody the other day that was like, I still haven't seen Hereditary. I'm like, why not? And they're like, well, I heard it was stupid. And I was like, who the fuck said that shit? Like, if you watched it and think it's stupid, then that's cool. But, like, you should definitely watch it for yourself. Dude, I'm like a fucking dick rider for Z Zack Snyder. Look at the reviews for his movies, you know? And you still be watching it. Dude, Batman vs. Superman, that three-hour cut on repeat, you know? And that's one of those ones that I acknowledge some of the flaws to it, but I'm still like, nah, dude, this, this is fucking fire. Right. His version of Justice League, dude, I'm sitting there like, mm -mm, mm -mm. you can nitpick it, but I see no true flaws here. Like what you like. End of story. Yeah. We might shit on something, but that's our opinion. That's not for you. You might love something we fucking hate. You might hate something we fucking love. And you know what? That's what makes the world go round. God damn it. Yeah. I've got a tattoo of a fucking new metal album. Okay. Like, are you really going to sit there and say, well, he didn't say it's a 10 out of 10. Motherfucker. I, I, this dude trashy. Yeah, dude. What part of I'm growing a rat tail and I've got new metal tattoos? Like, what, bro? Do not take me as like this fine arts fucking like. Nah, dude. I'm not a Shakespearean. Okay, like I'm a piece of garbage. This man. This man's sophisticated as fuck, y'all. Only for the ladies. That's it.
We're just a couple dumbasses in a fucking office room making a podcast. You don't have to take a goddamn thing we say seriously. Except for this. Visit SuperMediaBrosPodcast.com for past, present, and future episodes. Check out all the other shows on the Odd Pods Media Network by visiting oddpodsmedia.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on social media, especially on twitter.com slash supermediabros underscore. That's where we're the most active. Buy a t-shirt. Buy a koozie for your beer. Buy a hoodie. Buy a fucking raglan tee. Those raglan tees are badass. They come in three colors. Fucking get something. God damn. The Brother Mania tee is still running wild in the merch store, and you have until August to buy that motherfucker, because after SummerSlam, it's gone, bitch. Join us next week when we talk about WWE Backlash from motherfucking Puerto Rico. Oh, fuck this is weekend, isn't it? Yep. Goddamn, there's a new championship. Like, our fucking head of the table is, is still goddamn being acknowledged. And Let's be honest. Seth is getting that championship. I fucking hope so. But yeah, join us next week whenever that one, that one drops. And uh, yeah, just come fucking hang out with us and have a good time. Ready to get the fuck out of here? No, I'm ready for the fucking Bruins to get their shit together and not lose the playoffs. I, I thought for sure. They were going to get the Stanley Cup this season. God damn it. You and CM Punk both, probably. I don't know. I'm joking. I was about to say, I, I know he's a Chicago guy, but right. what would his second team be? I don't know. I don't know. What, would, what would his second city team be? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, man. Next season. Though. Next season. Thank you guys for hanging out with us this week. This has been episode 274 of Horrors and Hardograms. Until next time, I'm Richie. I'm Devin. Shades on. We're off.